Okay. We we are back, people. We've got Tim and Fran. Is it, it's Fran, not Fran. Fran. It's Fran. Fran. Yeah. Hey. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. However. <laughs> okay. Did I do it right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I you know I mangle things. Um, okay. We American things. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Um. So we've changed up our schedule, like we mentioned. There's going to be another round of breakouts after this. But right now we're going to talk about the can of worms. Um, there's a if you don't if you're not familiar with the can of worms, uh, there's a picture of worms on this uh, projector screen. I preferred the fireplace. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, the worms, like if they come out of the can, it's really hard to put them back in the can. They're problematic. Um, they can get stuck in your brain. Um, all kinds of things happen with worms. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. We'll let folks, and there will be a break after this too, I promise, I swear. Um, so basically, um, some of you have migrated from Drupal 7 to Drupal, and now 10, hopefully you're on 10. Um, and for some of you, that went swimmingly well and was super chill, and you had no problems. Some of you have not yet done it, and some of you had a painful, and um, there, were, there might have been crying, um, all kinds of experiences. And the goal here is to kind of like maybe talk about some of the harder aspects of where Drupal is at right now, and where the web is at in general right now. And like not shy away from those harder questions and conversations. And um, yeah, so, um, and hopefully we can learn from each other to help make things a little bit more easeful as we go forth in toward Drupal 11. So, um, yeah, how do we want to kick this off? Um, well, I introduced myself earlier and I've been here twice before already, but, um, <laughs> so I guess I don't really need to reintroduce myself, but very briefly, as I mentioned before, I'm the CTO of the Drupal Association and I have one of our senior Drupal engineers, Fran, with me. Fran, would you like to tell people where you came from to get out here and a little bit about what you're doing at the DA as it relates to D7 and 10? Yeah, sure thing. So, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, I came all the way from Spain. Um, yeah, love this week. It's, it's been so much fun so far. Um, yeah, probably the reason why I'm sitting down is because I am undergoing one of those fear migrations. I am helping the DA migrate uh, most of the Drupal 7 sites to Drupal 10 and beyond. We've done so in a few of them already. We are kind of, I want to say halfway in some others. And we might need to take some hard decisions as well on the ones that have not yet started. So yeah, that's probably the reason why I'm sitting here. So. Yeah. So um, as far as that goes, I do want to, I think we did this in the intro, but I have not kept track of uh, what the ratio was. So I'd like to ask again, um, just around the room, who is currently on Drupal, uh, let's say Drupal 10. Let's start there. All right, wow, it was awesome. really good. So congratulations. <laughs> um, you probably don't need us here. If you wanna just go get some <laughs> drinks, um, celebrate, that's awesome. Um, who is on Drupal 7? I, I don't have enough hands for the number <laughs> of seven sites that I have. Okay, um, good, good. Who's on Drupal 6? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, is that bad? I, I said it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll get into that a little bit. Yeah, no. Um, okay, so that's... Is anyone on eight or nine? Yeah, actually. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. So um, I'll set the stage sort of briefly here, which is to say that the the overwhelming, I think, like initial hurdle to think about in the migration process, and I hope those who've already done it will nod along and kind of agree, was this transition to, hey, we have to understand a command line oriented, composer based workflow for managing Drupal moving forward, right? And for understanding what dependency management means and how we deal with these other libraries being pulled into our Drupal sites 
and all of this stuff. And we are told that this has so many benefits and it's going to be good for us in all these ways. And uh, what it actually means is I do composer upgrade whatever and it says, sorry, uh, this thing says I need version 10 and this one says I need version 12 and uh, you're screwed. Um, so that's, that's not so fun, um, and it's something we all have to deal with. The, the composer why not command is one of my favorites, by which I mean one of my least favorites, but we get to use it a lot. Um, and uh, so, you know, it is it is a little bit of a journey. We talked earlier about how we're trying to abstract away from this problem space with things like Starshot and with a lot of these other initiatives that are supposed to help. But what do you do now? Starshot's timeline lines up pretty closely with the end of life and you're hoping to be done by the time that gets there, right? If you're still on seven, you wanna, you wanna be migrated by January 5th of next year. Um, uh, or you need to uh, really figure out something else. But um, so, so we'll start knowing that context. We'll start knowing that the people up here are in this boat um, and that some of our boats have, uh, they're, they're leaking um, and we're bailing um, and trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, let me throw it out and say, first of all, is there someone who's done the 10 migration who had kind of a rough time of it, maybe, and would like to share what was the hard part? I'd be really curious to hear that from someone out in the audience. Uh, well, let's do the seven, the seven to modern first, and then let me ask the nine to ten. Yeah, I'd like to hear both. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, Absolutely. it's good. Let me let me repeat back some of that in case this is being recorded. I, I'm not 100% sure whether it's lasting the whole day or not. Um, but again, really quickly, the, the first area of consideration was contrib module readiness. If that was an issue for you, Every hand in the room should probably be raised. Um, the second one was Composer being um, maybe not the most user-friendly or overly verbose when trying to manage it. Again, everybody in the room. Uh, it's worth knowing that Composer, of course, is not a Drupal-created tool. Composer is a PHP. Yeah, it's a P <laughs> it is a PHP ecosystem tool, but we have close connections to those people. Uh, like I know I'm Niels, I'm Seldak, and these, these folks, they've come to DrupalCon. Uh, we've met with them in other places, so we do have the opportunity to influence some things, and we've had influence on the composer already. Um, so that's that's an interesting point. Bef maybe even before we respond again, I did want to hear the nine to ten uh, pain point that was being suggested from someone on that side of the room. I thought, what, was there one on? I, I just wanted to give the chance to whoever it was who mentioned it a second ago. Okay, okay. Well. CP editor. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Even if they are, hopefully it's a safe space. It's not, yeah. Okay, so dependency hell with some CK editor sub modules and all of those things. That's good. Uh, I think Irina, did you have a 
su comment or suggestion on that front as well? Yeah. And yeah, okay, so that was the, for some reason a minor release was actually easier than a, a major when it was 9.3 to 9.5 and then 9.5 to 10. Yeah. Yeah. Our we were all psyched, right? yeah. 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 There's so okay. So these these cover a couple points, and I think, fortunately or unfortunately, they're mostly the ones that I expected to hear, mm -hmm. which is to say that the ones that I know the core maintainers uh, got an earful about <laughs> from the whole community when there was some some weird dependency f flipping, like you know the CK case, right? One of the problems of the hey, we're incorporating better made elsewhere technology into Drupal, is we cannot always align the roadmap. And if we say, hey, Drupal wants to be supported until this date, and a core component, uh, which is a separate software project, says, sorry, we're end of lifing that version on this date, um, we get a little bit stuck. And that's definitely something that we, we got to fix. Um, more general pain points before I then flip it to you, to start asking or sharing um, some other thoughts. Did that cover the, the majority of what hurt? <laughs> I'd like to hear a success story so that we have something to compare with all this yeah. feedback. Yeah, actually. If it's the same person. No, all good. Right, okay, so, and that's sort of a, once you get there, there's a lot of potential and a lot of, so there's, um, I think for a lot of people, there's actually a, a lot of strong business logic reasons to be using some of the features that exist in modern Drupal, but that it's that upgrade path to get there that I think has been hard for a lot of folks. And, yes? Yeah. So that, that was worth a while. Okay. Um, this is a little bit asinine, but uh, <laughs> the opportunity to do a content audit. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Woo! This is why this is the room of honesty. Oh, that's a phrase I love to hear. So I hope that's encouraging. Well, actually, it's encouraging to me. I still have to do it. But um, I hope that's encouraging to other folks who have some who are on sort of the seven space. Um, I'd like to hear directly from someone who is still on seven. So you haven't made the jump at all. Is there a biggest fear, or is there? Even worse, have you started and had to stop because something just blocked you? Um, anyone want to sh Way in the back. Organic groups. Ah, okay, organic groups. And so migrating group, group permissions, um, kind of all the models that come along with that and finding what the replacement might be, okay? Right, and um, yeah, I can see that. Whew. 
I, I said, like, oh, thank goodness I don't run a big software project site with a lot of users and groups that have a... Um, uh, yeah, but um, actually, quick question. Uh, what, d in general terms, what kind of industry uh, is that site serving? It's uh, legal education. Legal education, okay, cool. Good context. Okay, so I've got a few more hands go up around this. There was one in the middle and one over here. Irina? Irina, why don't you go ahead? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll mention that in a second. Actually, I'll, I'll touch on that. But. Yeah. There's um. So maybe I should start answering some questions and stuff. I'm, I was trying to kind of hoodwink everyone by just keep asking, then nobody can ask me anything, and it's. <laughs> It works really well, but um, what, uh, groups, I think, organic groups is an interesting example of, you know, in our earlier conversation when we had um, uh, Laurie and Gabor here, right, he talks about how we, the core uh, maintainer team and kind of the core initiative leads and all those folks were so heavily focused on core that they're like, wow, we built this awesome upgrade path for X, Y, and Z, and you can get from here to here in core, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe nobody was clocking that like, especially in educational websites or especially in like these high like user group kind of things, organic groups might be in use by a huge number of people, but it's not in core, so we didn't think about having to have a solution for that, right? Funnily enough, because of a star shot, I've listened to core committers talk about upgrade paths with contrib modules, as right. in yesterday, because as Starshot is now going to be incorporating most, some of the most used uh, contrib modules. So yeah, it's basically what Tim said. Probably they are so focused in their own reality that they never look outside of it. Mm -hmm. But thanks to this new initiative, they are actually looking up and see what's out there. And that's contrib modules, which are used by thousands of sites all the sites use country. So that's, I think, one of the nice side effects as well. And I, and I think specifically, you know, I don't think, we'll probably not go into technical tutorials and migration assistance and all those things, because I don't think we can all afford to be here till next Thursday. But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, <laughs> or longer, <laughs> yes. But um, I do think, so, so group module was thrown out there. That's definitely a choice that, and you know, that was developed specifically for this reason, needing an alternative to organic groups in the modern version. There's also an interesting set of things you can do to replicate groups like functionality with the new access policy framework that is actually in core and with event condition action, ECA. Those are just things I would jot down to uh, take a look at. Um, ECA is interesting because it's also kind of got a visual programming language built in. You snap together logic, um, and that um, might actually be particularly useful uh, for some of y'all in that case. Um, let's, let's switch to start, again, taking more questions and more feedback uh, rather than me asking it all. But I think that got out in the open a lot of the things that we're concerned about. So. Fran, I don't know if either you or I know the answer to this one, but... Yeah, it's... At the end of the day, you all need to understand that there is people behind modules. Most modules should offer an upgrade um, path, and I'm not talking Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, I'm talking 1.1 to 1.2. They are adding new features, and then if they do that, they should somehow offer 
a mapping from the old mapping to the new mapping. So that should be part of the upgrade. That should be docu documented. You are 100% right. That is the right way to do it. Now, core committers, uh, contrib modules that are used by thousands and thousands of projects, they do pay a lot of attention to that. But kind of coming back to what I started, there's people behind it. And it might be that the person doing it didn't think of that. They are just not looking at the usage of the module, and then they forgot to provide that replacement. So Drupal in itself has the tools for it. So we can code in Drupal how to change that map into the new one. That's, I wouldn't say easy, but that's doable if you are a developer. Drupal.org offers the possibilities of change records, like what has changed between the last release to this release. Um, and then even all the modules, I mean, many of the modules have a kind of change log uh, file, which actually lists all, all of these have changed. And if you want to move from A to B, you need to follow these steps. But again, unfortunately, not all modules do that. And that's the reality of it. So, yeah. yeah. And clarification, um, I mean, we're talking general case about, I mean, do you mean literal localization string translation, like multilingual as well? Okay, so not you, you're not talking about just translating a change in schema because the module went from 1.2 to 1.3. You're, you're, you're literally meaning you're managing some multilingual site and some content editor somewhere has changed copy in one language that has not been updated in the translation for the five other languages you support or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so... I feel like this slightly gets out of the realm of, of this particular can of worms, but one of the things I would suggest is, to me that sounds like a something to do with the revisions and notifications problem. There might be a, there might be a translation notifications module, there might be a revision notifications module, or there might be a way to write an ECA logic query to create that to say, because I suspect with something like ECA, you could say, yep. if there is a revision on this node, but no revisions on these language versions of the node, uh, mark that node in a, in a dashboard. Or, or something trigger like notifications. Or, yeah. tr or trigger notifications. To languages yeah. that are not the one that was edited, so yeah. Yeah, that, I, I suspect that's possible to solve. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting one. Other mm. questions for us or about the pain points we've collectively discussed? or anything we've missed. All right, maybe we should reflect back some of what we heard. So you've been taking some notes here, friend. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing any of the important things uh, mentioned. So I probably go with the easiest one. Uh, first of all, it's been a big learning exercise for people using Drupal, for people building Drupal's, Drupal, for people building the tooling to be Drupal. Um, because it's been learning, that means that it was kind of untested territory. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what was going to be the usage. We didn't know. We cannot predict the future. So things like, for example, update from 7 to 8, that, I mean, 7 to 8, that was the hardest. But if you think about it, we can do 7 to 9, and we can do 7 to 10, and we can do 7 to 11. So that means that there is something good that they did along the road. Now, eight to nine was hard. There, nine to 10 was hard. 10 to 11 is meant to be smooth, really smooth. If you are on top of things, it's gonna be like almost a minor. And that's part of the learning exercise that it's been going on. Like, uh, yeah, we could not predict how Composer packages who are going to interact, external libraries, contrib modules, and they've been putting a lot of tooling in place to make those transitions a bit smoother. But yeah, they were hard, and that's the reality. Um, feel free to stop or interrupt at any time. I mean, I'm just gonna go through the list, but feel free to talk. This is conversational. Oh, yes. Yeah, let's talk about that one a little bit. Um, so there's a few things going on in the contrib space that have made an enormous difference compared to 
uh, well, going back years now, um, and I think that are making a really big difference going forward. So I don't know if you follow, you know, the drop is moving handle and Mastodon and Twitter and some of those things that post um, update readiness reports. This is something that Gabor does, who was just in here before. Um, but basically, there is a, there's a project update bot, uh, if you're not aware, on Drupal.org that goes to all of the modules that exist and uh, scans their code base and says, hey, you're using something in your Drupal 10 version that's going to be deprecated in Drupal 11. And by the way, I've generated a patch automatically that will fix it. And all the maintainer has to do is actually commit that patch. Um, and that significantly improves how fast the ecosystem gets ready. Um, there are already 11 compatible modules, for example, before we even have a release candidate, um, right? So, and that, that was true the last couple of versions and it's been getting better and better. They've been writing more rector rules and more versions for this. But there's actually one more new initiative that I think is really, really powerful, which is to say they've decided, and this is a little bit unusual in open source governance, but I think it's important for a project of our scale. They've decided to create a project update working group or committee basically that not only, not only are we going to basically hand on a silver platter to the module maintainers what they need to be compatible, but after a notification process, this group is gonna be empowered to go in and directly commit to those if they haven't done it proactively, right? Mm -hmm. So if, the, if, the, if there's a maintainer that's just disappeared because they've wandered away from the project, but their module's very important, this group will have, uh, there's already a process to hand off a module from one set of maintainers to another, but this, this particular group will have sort of accelerated access to ensure compatibility of modules. Um, and that's something they're just starting um, mm -hmm. this year um, for, for this next set of upgrades. So we're hoping that's gonna help moving forward. Yeah, I mean, and I'd say that those two things are huge in the sense that there is many people willing to support and to help with the upgrades, but they were not capable of taking over a module that somebody else did 10 years ago, and they don't care about supporting it anymore. We needed to follow a loan process because obviously that person created it and all that. So we need to follow a series of steps that sometimes were frustrating and took long. And the creation of that working group is a huge, huge step forward. And then the other thing he mentioned, it was about the update bot. And that kind of ties perfectly with what I said before about the learning. The first version of the update bot was only created when Drupal 9 was out. I mean, we were in Drupal 8, and Drupal 9 was already out. The second version of the bot was created at the tail end of Drupal 9 and when Drupal 10 was created. Now, the Drupal 11 bot has been running for more than a month and we, don't, and we didn't even have Drupal 11. So that has been part of the learning. We've used that tool that was amazing and that helped, that is the one tool that helped the most to contrive modules for them to be ready when the new version comes out. But obviously if the bot doesn't run before the new version, it's impossible for modules to be ready. And the difference is that we already have many modules that are Drupal 11 compatible, even if Drupal 11 is not there yet. So that has been as well improving the journey for developers, for site builders. So if you upgrade to Drupal 11, you can be safe that most of the contrib modules, if not all of them, will be ready for it. And if not, we have the Linean documentation that some of you were talking about, but the goal is to not even need Linean. The modules should be ready and the bot is kind of helping them do it. And let me, this is a good opportunity to talk about some tools for those of you who are, well, you're, we're all gonna be doing our next upgrades. For some of you, you're still doing your seven to 10 or possibly by the time you're doing it, seven to 11 um, upgrade and all these things. And so underlying that project update bot we just talked about, there is a tool uh, called Drupal Rector, which is based on PHP Rector, which you can actually use. You can run the same upgrade compatibility um, utility that this bot is running against your custom code, which you probably have filling your Drupal 7 site. And we didn't hear it in the conversation before, but I would actually guess that one of the biggest barriers for a lot of people in their upgrade is the custom module that you have, uh, either a mega module or a series of small custom modules that you need to get compatible with, with Drupal 10, or uh, as the case may be. And so again, this tool, this Rector tool, can actually generate automatic compatibility fixes and all sorts of things. There's a second tool that's very useful called um, 
uh, Retrofit. Retrofit was a community-developed tool, and believe it or not, it can basically just run Drupal 7 written code in modern Drupal. Um, it's got kind of a wrapper to emulate older PHP. It's complicated. To emulate basically older PHP function calls in modern PHP versions, and that allows it to run some Drupal 7 stuff unchanged. It's not perfect, but it can save you a lot of steps if there's something that's just really hard to, uh, to migrate. Um, Yeah, Re the retrofit recording on the DrupalCon playlist should be should be useful as well for some of those folks. Um, I'm trying to think as well if there was another obvious tool. Um, yeah, upgrade yeah. status is also yeah of course a natural one, um, which is just um, the upgrade status module will basically tell you of all the things you're currently using how many of them are ready for the next upgrade. So you don't like, so you don't do that composer upgrade command and get the giant incompatibility list, right? It'll sort of run that for you and be like, hey, guess what? Your site's ready to go or it's waiting on this particular module and then you'll be ready, right? At least, at the very least, it narrows down the scope of what you need to be watching for to get onto that next version. And so that can help quite a bit. And for your custom modules, it tells you exactly what you need. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah, awesome. exactly. It's, it's, it's really, really helpful in that in that sense. Um, yes, please. Uh-huh. Okay, yes. That's a good question. So for... I think so, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> this is an interesting, this is an interesting question. So I'll explain the problem space that we're talking about here real quickly. So, and this again comes from Composer more than it comes from Drupal. But in dependency management systems, um, you specify what version range your current package is compatible with, right? And so for, for the majority of the contrib ecosystem, um, when the next major version of Drupal comes out, it turns, they, turns out it's already compatible, except that it says it isn't, <laughs> except <laughs> that the version string just says, oh, hey, we're not. And the reason that that is generally preferred is because we don't know until the new version comes out whether that will be true. Yeah. So it could be, so if one option, and there are some contrib maintainers who've done this, one option is to say, release a version that says my module is, is compatible with 10 and up. But then someday, Drupal 13 comes out, it will have something that is not actually compatible, but because of that version string, it will install it anyway and your site will break. Yeah. Now, so the choice right now is block you from updating even when it's just the string that needs to be changed or upgrade you and hope that there isn't an underlying deprecation that's going to break something. Now, what could hypothetically happen, I see, I see gears turning, is now that we have things like rector scanning and upgrade status, it's possible that it could say, is that the only reason for incompatibility? And if that's if it is the only reason, uh, could we write a composer plugin that says, okay, ignore that and go ahead and install it? Which and is that's called lenient. Yeah. So there is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the main thing is what Tim explained is whether you are willing to take a risk or not. If we put my module is compatible with Drupal 10 and above, and that module at some point is not and break your site, you will not be happy. You will be way less happy that if you need to go and fix 200 uh, modules uh, for that tiny string where you guarantee that the module is compatible. So yeah, it's, 
it's really a matter. I understand that it's a pain. We we've all needed to do it. I mean, so many times, and it's tiring, and it's so simple. And it's as you say, why don't we automate it? It is automated up to a point in in the sense that the robot will send you a patch or a merge request, but at the end of the chain needs to be a human that press a button that validates. All right, it's valid. Let's go for it. Um, yeah, it's it's really a, a kind of risk taking kind of decision. And yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, now, let's keep it that and, way. And that is this does go back to that is another reason why another reason why we create why the core maintainers I won't say we that I, to be clear again the DA is not the sole decision maker or even the primary decision maker on pro product roadmap, but the reason why the product leadership decided that let's actually make a group that is empowered to commit to modules that are not their own was just so they could do that. So they could be like, oh, there's a thousand modules where all they need is the version string fix. Okay, we can do that, like on behalf of everybody else. Yeah. So that's, a, that's you know, there's, there's multiple ways to, to solve that problem, but I think that's the one they're looking at right now to avoid entirely removing that last human check on the, on the process. <laughs> Well, cool. yeah. I, we can always talk about Composer. <laughs> but we chose to use it, so it's a relevant question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You touch. Yeah. And I think there's two ways that at least we on the Drupal side can influence that, which is to, one is I go find Niels and I bother him until he fixes it. Um, <laughs> another is possibly we can write a composer plugin and make it actually part of ship with core or something like that, make it a dependency or an optional dependency of Drupal that is like a clean composer error as much as module, you know, or something. And there's also, there is multiple levels of verbosity you can configure, so I don't know if one of those would work. I see a hand that's desperate to be called on. Was that right? Oh, just stretch it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a very enthusiastic mm -hmm. hand. Um, Composer itself is open source, yes. Yeah. So packages.org is the site yeah. where you get the list of Composer packages, but Composer itself is open source. They've accepted merge requests from the Drupal community in the past. Uh, actually, we had significant influence on why Composer 2 is way more performant than Composer 1 was. That was mostly Drupal people participating in that conversation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Well, that's an interesting. Yeah. Oh, the bots, I'm the bots building themselves. <laughs> so I, I asked before like about the good experiences because I think this is always tied with with the bot as well. Um, I want to ask you all: How many of you have you ever moved houses? <laughs> have you taken everything that was in house A to house B, or? Some of you did. Some of you decided to do some cleanup along the way. <laughs> so these are the kind of things that, that came up. It was like upgrading was a great, great, great opportunity to audit the site about decisions that were taken 10, 15 years ago and to decide whether I want to migrate them or not. Because sometimes it might be that 
I might actually not need this. Then I don't need to run the mi migration for it, or maybe I don't need the contrib module for it. So I think part of the upgrade is as well that it offers the possibility of cleaning up. It brings new tools. I don't know who mentioned Layout Builder and how easy it was because they got rid of all the custom templates. That's a great example. That means that they did not need to migrate templates. You, not a line of code, you just use my uh, Layout Builder. It's maybe more intuitive, like more modern. So sometimes you, I think it's great to go to that, through that exercise, whether you are migrating or not, actually. Um, and then, yes, yeah, somebody touched on performance as well. And to be honest, I mean, this is, the, this is the reason why we need to do updates, end of life and performance. Because if we don't do them, then we are risking ourselves big time. I mean, to, we are exposing ourselves to an end of life technology that could be vulnerable to something. And then also when it comes to performance, like we want our sites to be fast. But if we are running software that was written 15 years ago on new machines, that might be tricky. So again, it's, it's hard. I'm not saying that this is, uh, I mean, I always say it's a bumpy road, no matter which path you choose. It might be, for some of them, might be less bumpy. Some of them will be more bumpy. But it's going to be a bumpy road because we're talking about an upgrade. Moving house is not always easy. So the same. Um, but yeah, just what, I, what I'm trying to get in here is stay with the positives, try to do an audit, try to see what you can clean up because doing those kind of things before will help a long way. It's not the same moving 10 boxes than 100 boxes. So yeah, that's why I wanted to ask before about the positive. And I think actually that leads to another um, strategic choice or tactical choice that you could make in your, if you're planning your upgrade process. And so this is something we are doing with Drupal.org, for example. So for a lot of folks, um, part of, a big part of the issue, even if you want to do a content audit, is the scale, right? Uh, you may have a large property or you may have a small team that still makes that a large problem, right? And you may decide, look, I could tackle understanding, you know, this whole category of my website are like, are like, I don't know, civic engagement portion, but not our CRM integration. Like I can't, just can't hold it all in my brain at once. Um, one of the things we're doing for Drupal.org and some, you know, our subsite stuff is uh, as a technical strategy, we're using our CDN that fronts the whole site and we are progressively migrating certain portions of our site and redirecting those paths so that parts of the site will be served from Drupal 10 and stuff we haven't gotten to yet is still served from 7 and we use single sign-on between the two, or we're going to be using single sign-on between the two, so that you're still transparently logged into both for any activities that you're doing. But for example, if we want to refresh with the awesome new brand theme that got put on stage or something like that, put that on our marketing pages, get that coat of paint up there, we can do that and then realize we still have time to figure out the 12,000 documentation pages on Drupal.org and how we want to handle those without having to like, Eat, eat the whole thing at once, right? Um, and so there are a few different ways that you can divide up um, the workload to make that migration process perhaps a little bit easier, um, or at least to to let you think of it in more discrete chunks um, that are easier to hold in your mind at a, at a time. So, um, yes. Mm. You may not really fully understand what to do or the scale of what you do. And uh, you know, have the possibility of to have that connection in the long run and also again go to content audit and everything. I think that's one of the positives. Yeah, and that is a great example, the stakeholder engagement example as being part of your upgrade process. Um, it's something we should be doing regardless of software updates, frankly, but sometimes the only opportunity we get is when the upgrade is a forcing function. Um, and so you know, I, I use documentation as an example, but like, I really, I would love it if we are not migrating a bunch of documentation that was written for Drupal 4, 5, and 6 that is actually <laughs> still on Drupal.org. Yeah. Drupal.org, so one of the strange things about Drupal.org, strange? R remarkable things about Drupal.org <laughs> is um, it's probably the longest lived Drupal website that was actually like upgraded in place. To date, 
so far, it has not ever actually been like replaced through a migration to a new instance of Drupal. It was actually like an upgraded upgraded code base every time going all the way back to when it was running on the various version. Yeah. <laughs> and as my, my colleague Julia is saying, literally everything that was ever written by the community about Drupal is still on this site. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's a lot of things we're doing. Like uh, another thing we're doing that is perhaps a helpful example, and, you know, you'll have to draw the analogy to the kinds of systems you integrate with, but Drupal.org used to, we predate Git. Not just GitHub, we predate Git as a, like, software collaboration version control system, right? Drupal, Drupal is older than that system. We were on a different one. Um, we predate GitHub. So when we wanted people to collaborate on building Drupal, we had to create a collaboration process. We used um, CVS version control for a while. We wrote our own issue queues. We wrote our own test bots. When Travis first came on the scene, we tried to use it and we couldn't. We literally would just time out everything that Travis could do. Um, it was not efficient or fast enough. And so it's only recently that we were like, hey, guess what? Other people made Git management tools and we can use GitLab and we don't have to build it all ourselves anymore with a team of four people, um, including <laughs> me. And I don't get to code very much these days. So, um, so right, so one of the things we're doing is we're, we're taking a chainsaw and lopping off a huge section of Drupal.org and saying that's now the responsibility of our GitLab instance. And we're writing integrations between the rest of Drupal.org and our GitLab instance. So all of the issues of which there are millions of nodes, um, right, those are gonna migrate to GitLab before we have to think about migrating them to Drupal 10, right? So there are probably aspects of what you do, there are probably integrations you already have where you wanna be seriously thinking, you know, what can we eliminate, deprecate, or migrate before upgrading uh, instead of after? <laughs> Yeah, I think that touches very well with uh, one of the points I had written down when, yeah, there is really a, not a direct replacement for the new version of Drupal. Somebody was talking of organic groups, but yeah, you name it, anything that is important for your site and you just don't have a direct replacement, an easy upgrade path. So this was kind of our case. I mean, we were in a position in which the modules we use for our issue queue, credit system, and so many other things, we could either rewrite them all on Drupal 9 or we could really sit down and think, is there anything better that can do the job? And that was the case. That was, in this case, we, we found a tool, a current up-to-date uh, tool that everybody uses, and we decided to instead write migrations. And in this case, they're not even Drupal migrations. They are just like hard code migrations. Like this is the issue in Drupal. I'm gonna create it on GitLab and I'm gonna do the mapping myself. So it's not even a Drupal migration. So yeah, sometimes you might be in that hard spot where you don't have an option, a direct replacement. And um, yeah, because this is such a unique situation, you can decide, it, decide whether to go one route and say, I'm gonna change my tooling and see if there is something that adapts to it. Or maybe I want to go, I mean, we, we mentioned before I, the kind of soft landing um, places for Drupal 7, there are, and maybe if that is so business critical for your site, you are not gonna f find anybody that can replace it to anything else, maybe that's the way that you need to go. So yeah, it's, it's really exploring, but each case, each site, each context is gonna be unique as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is that during your migration, you're also doing a redesign. Those old pages are going to look kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> no. I totally agree. So the housekeeping is such an important thing. In the real world, the small organizations might, have the might not have the resources to do that. We're migrating to a bunch of sites that are 8 to 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, like you, I feel you. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, D. O. is a site that's, it I seems think, that, that he's working for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Only our site's twenty years old. Um, I think. Uh, I actually, I need to double check when D. O. first went online, but a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there was a time when it was drop.org before it was Drupal.org, but like, anyway. Um, 
so no, that's a really good point. To the, to the point about using the CDN and sort of code switching the design layer, um, it's not an amazing solution, but one of the solutions that we're implementing is using, it's a practical solution, yeah, and, it's, so yeah. and we're going to mm -hmm. add we're going to add a common you know we're not going to retheme the old site, but we're going to add a common navigation system between the two, so that at least your header and footer kind of look consistent, and maybe your view portal looks like it's the old uh, site, um, but you'll you'll more or less feel like you're there. I mean, y'all are going to see it, so I hope we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one of the things, you know, again, we talked earlier about how you're pitching these projects internally to try and get approval or even in your own head to try and understand why you're doing them the way that you're doing them. And to me, the part of the reason to do it in this sort of like progressive way, choosing these different either functional areas or, you know, paths or subdomain, however it might be broken up, is because that means you can actually keep delivering value on your digital digital experience and not wait for a big bang transition. Because a lot of the times we think about this upgrade as a single big bang transition in which all uh, feature delivery has stopped until that's complete as a whole. Uh, and that, to be honest, that's what happened with the six to seven Drupal.org migration where it was like, well, there was all these other functional things that would have been great for the community, but everything stopped until all at once we could go from six to seven. And this at least gives you the opportunity to be delivering something that your constituents need, whether that's your coworkers or your actual uh, audience that you serve as part of your mission. And, um, you know, potentially be like showing the kind of progress, again, at an executive level, people are kind of like, I don't want to hear about the upgrade. Great, I'm glad you did the security release, whatever, whatever. I want to know when that landing page for our big donation campaign is going to be pretty and not like it's a, AltaVista page in 1998 or whatever. Um, yeah, these two points you said that you think that it's a Google that they didn't think Google as optimal. Five years ago now, and depending on what part of Google you see the new thing, they didn't have any issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that I would always pick Google as my best example of user experience, but but no. That's, yeah. there you go. So That's the way to put it. Yeah, and that could be, yeah, the, the, the part of it is there's a lot, you can use the idea of an upgrade as a forcing function to get other critical things done for stakeholders as uh, was commented before, as a way to have an excuse to do a needed content audit, as an excuse to do needed content cleanup, or you can be constrained and not have the opportunity to do those things, but still have to choose, okay, we're going to find some way to make this bite-sized, more discreet, deliver some essential value and give us enough oxygen to get those other pieces done along the road, so. So, two things. First, we have five minutes left. Oh. <laughs> And then the fact that you really, really do need to go back and fix those Drupal 7 modules. 
Yeah, there is a... Um, You probably don't want to be burying tiger traps for yourself to fall into when in the process of doing this. So there is a calculus there, and and in some ways that that pushes you towards if you have to leave something behind. In some cases, leaving behind something that is user facing because that will get attention rather than one that's totally under the hood that might be forgotten about. Um, I think that's completely fair. Um, we mentioned, we alluded to, we spoke in nebulous terms about this concept of the Drupal 7 soft landing. I'm gonna to speak to that a little bit too, right? So there's this concept or this general initiative as well, right? You've heard of Backdrop, perhaps, a fork of Drupal 7 that's out there. You might be thinking, we talked about this earlier, but you might be thinking, is WordPress actually a better choice for me? Uh, should we, be, should, is, is all this too much? Should I just have a Squarespace site? You know, whatever the case may be, right? We made, the, we, we made the philosophical case, I think, that you, you should be on an open platform with data sovereignty. You should be thinking about privacy. You should really be considering um, your digital presence as a, like an active daily part of your mission and not a one and done project like printing a flyer. Um, but even so, there's technical choices to make within that range. Um, and so you can consider at a certain scales, the same way that Johanna said, you work with clients, some of whom WordPress is the right choice, um, some of whom Drupal continues to be the right choice, uh, depending on probably mostly their level of ambition, um, the need for structured data, the need for accessibility and other features. But as Fran alluded to earlier, there are some people who are like, we have no resources. It is the, mo the most mission critical thing is that we're just still online in the next two years. And there are some options for that too that are much potentially more affordable in the short term, maybe or maybe not more affordable in the long term. You'll have to pursue whether they have in turn an upgrade path back to Drupal if you're like, oh, I really want that. But there's uh, certainly folks who can talk to you about that and I think you can find some folks with those options too. But I'd like to switch to any like either one final question or a final comment from someone out in the audience before I wrap it up or we wrap it up. Yeah. I just had a comment when you were picking up. Maybe not entirely my space, but Matt and Kira, can you pick up when you're when you're raising the secrets off the client, you mentioned creating one to be done. Sometimes is there to be just really honest with people about some people in the mentality of one to be done? I think there's a gallery in Edinburgh, I don't know if it's still true or not, but I did ten years ago they had a massive project for the website. It's a beautiful project. And it, and I I said the, the, the presentation was talking they did a lot of work on it. And at the very end, they said, oh, is this on Drupal 8? Because there's a site called No Direct, No Drupal 7. Mm -hmm. The site is WordPress, but it's still on Drupal 7. There's this new site. And I, I just think the mentality was one to be done. They had like a big ass project and they had like a team that worked. I hear that they're a non profit, they don't have to make money. Yeah. I just think sometimes there needs to be a conversation that says, look, you've got to understand the integrity and the yeah. I, I, was, I was talking, maybe by way of wrapping this up, I was talking to uh, a couple of you actually um, in, during the lunch break, I think it was, about these kinds of things. And there's a, there is a difference in, mental, in mentality about the way we think about websites, about the way we think about our digital, the digital half of our mission that we need to communicate back to both like internal and external stakeholders, right? Even Drupal, when it was started, was, was in a, time when we thought about the web, a website, you know, actually borrowing Fran's house metaphor, a website was a thing you built, and then you might build a new one, and we didn't necessarily think of it as a place you live 100 years, and then renovate, and then install new appliances into, and then add an electric car charger, or, you know, like, we, we haven't started changing the conversation to realize that just because something is online does not mean it's ephemeral or disposable. And that's not something that I think a, a particularly internal leadership or external leadership think about a lot. And that factors into how we structure and prioritize our, our kind of upgrade projects and everything we do along the way so that once we get to the time for an upgrade, we're prepared to do it. So I know that what I didn't do today is I didn't say, oh, here's the magic wand that will solve your upgrade. 
or guess what, tomorrow we're going to release the super cool feature that will do it all for you, or any of those things. Because the point of this was having a, a really honest discussion, and I know that I never got back to that Drupal 6 site I mentioned that we still have to deal with. <laughs> so we can pretend I didn't say that. But um, no, but the, uh, the point being that there are genuine challenges, and we're not going to pretend they're not, but they are, those challenging things are the same challenges, the same, the same reason to, over, to choose to overcome those challenges are the same reasons you chose to have a digital presence in the first place, right? The, the same reason that you chose to do this hard thing of creating digital engagement, of serving your mission in a digital way and not just a, an a interpersonal way, and, um, it's, and realizing that like, you know, the same door-to-door -door mailing strategy that your nonprofit might have had in the 80s is probably not what you should have now your digital presence just got to change in every five, 10 years as well. And we got to keep making that argument. So anyway, thank you very much again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. That was, that was awesome. Thanks to all of you for asking great questions. Um, the cliche is that the hardest thing about technology is actually people. Um, it's just true, and this is why developer skills and communication skills are actually at least equally important. So that's just something I've learned. Um, it's really true. We're gonna take a break um, now for 15 minutes, and then we're gonna have our final breakout um, of the day. And I should put that on here so that we know what it is. No? Oh no, wrong way, go back. I'll see you in Hotland. Oh, yeah, well, you yeah, already know that, right? Oh, yeah, that, okay. So we're going to come back. These are the breakouts for after, after the 15 minute break. So 3 15, it's really a 12 minute break. Um, 3 18. Yeah, if you didn't check in when you came to the summit, could you check off your name with Julia here at the front table? It just helps the Drupal Association track who came. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, we are reconvening. It's 317, I said 318, I'll give it, you know. Um, this is the last breakout of the day and then you are free to go outside and breathe clean, fresh air. And is it actually 80? It's 78 according to my watch. So, uh, 81. I mean, it was like 41 when I got here, so, like two days ago. All right. Um, that's hard to pack for. So, almost. I'm waiting till 318, like I said. I mean, it's, it's like this in New England, too, but all right. Let's, let's just do it. Okay, now it's 318. All right. So, last breakouts. And um, I'm sorry that we're, we wanted to do more sharebacks after breakouts, but, but we jammed some star shot in here. So, so like that, that got changed up a little bit. And I'm sorry about that, but, um, but we will have parting remarks. But for those who will be leaving, if you leave early, um, I just want to make sure that you all know how much we appreciate you being here today. Um, and um, we hope you stay connected on Drupal Slack in the Nonprofits channel, on N10, Drupal Group, and all kinds of spaces that we are in between Drupal Cons, Drupal Camps, et cetera. All right, so, and thank you for saying, yes. and thank you, for saying you guys absolutely are the best people ever. <laughs> I mean, nonprofit workers, like, you know, like you're working long hours, you're not getting paid. Like, this feels familiar, right? Okay. Anyway, so web accessibility and site governance. Um, it's in the far corner back there. That's John. That's John. In the, in the brown jacket. He's brown jacket. Accessibility. Mm -hmm. Yep, that corner. He has a really good accent. Okay. Um, and oh, then. I'm just going to listen to that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and then. Um, using Drupal and small nonprofits with limited staff and financial resources. That's the other back corner. And then preparing for impact on your website redesign. That's Kelsey over here in this front corner. Um, development and hosting challenges. That's Bob. For, for nonprofits, that's Bob. Over there. You can just stay there. Bob is going to stay right there. We're going to go to Bob. What, what corner do we have left? The middle. We're going to put in the middle. And then... Um, that's right. Um, leveraging Civi CRM with Drupal is going to be in the middle of the room. With, with Jenna. Thank you, Jenna. With Jenna. Okay. And if you don't want to talk about, oh, if, also check and make sure you, if you're staying at the Hyatt, make sure you have your key. Someone lost their key. Um, so if you <laughs> lost your key, it's up here. And if there's something else you want to talk about, come talk to us and we'll make it happen.